This talk is basically me sharing uh, about a problem that we had at Duffel and the solution, or one of the solutions we implemented for this problem. Um, <clears throat> parts of this problem are generic, even though some parts are quite specific. I mean, I would still expect that many of you in this room have been through the same process that we were, um, and maybe it'll prompt some good questions and discussion, because I think with this talk as a starting point, there's a lot that we all can learn from each other. Um, if you've ever been to any of my other talks or seen them, then you know that I like to talk about performance. And this, uh, like, I'm not going to disappoint you. This is also a talk about performance. Um, but it's more specifically about reliability of performance. So it's more about the P99 than the average. Um, and it's also a talk about resource utilization. Um, oh, yeah, this is the thing I was told about. Okay. Um, so this is the, the mandatory slide with my, um, <coughs> my handles and stuff. And I'm going to leave this up just long enough that you can, like, you can put in my Twitter handle into your phones. And then you can, like, you can tweet something about how amazing and insightful my talk was and how I'm you know, a complete thought leader in the community, et cetera. Um, so go on. Go ahead. Do that now. So before I go into, also, like, are you not loving my beautiful slides? I put like, so much effort into this. Um, before I go into the actual like, technical solution and what we did, um, I need, like, we all need to be on the same page about the problem that we had. So basically, um, if you went to Adam's talk yesterday, then you learned a little bit about the airline industry. Um, it's important to remember that the airline industry, like the airline companies, are not really tech companies. You know, they're travel companies. They move people around the world. And um, they still had this, like, this revolution, right? Um, Adam was talking about how, you know, in the 60s, they were already, already like, revolutionizing um, their systems using, using computers. Um, in many ways, they're kind of still stuck in the 60s. And you see that in a lot of the ways they solve problems. So um, I'm just going to do like a little bit of trivia, because I, I find this fascinating myself, working with the airlines. Um, does anyone here know how many passengers can be on a booking? So the answer is nine. You cannot have more than nine passengers on a booking. If you need to book a, f a flight for more than nine passengers, you need to make multiple bookings. The reason why it's nine is because it's a single digit. It's the biggest number you can represent with a single digit. Because, like, really, can we fit more than one digit in there? Like, these computers, they can't handle that. That's way too many digits. Another example I really love is if you want to book a flight in the future, right? Airlines, that's basically what you do, right? You book in the future. Um, how far in the future can you book a flight? And the answer to that is, is quite similar, right? So the, the answer is 364 days. So it kind of differs. Some airlines have different limits, but they can't do more than 364. Because if you go with more than that, you can no longer unambiguously represent a date in the future with only the day and month. Right? You, if, you do, if you do like 365, then you've got to put the year in there too, because you don't know if it's, if it's like today is the 10th of June. You don't know if it's the 10th of June is today or the 10th of June in a year. So you've got a limit for 364. And we see this a lot. So the airline industry, they're trying to improve their systems. They're trying to make things better. And so um, that's why we have something now called NDC, which is the uh, new distribution cap capability. Um, also, if you went to Adam's talk, you learned a lot of abbreviations. They really like abbreviations. Um, and NDC is uh, an extremely modern state-of-the-art standard, which is why it uses SOAP and XML um, for everything. But it allows, it allows for a lot of things. It allows for searching for flights, booking them, you can do seat selection, ancillaries, baggage allowance. You can do all kinds of cool stuff. You can cancel your flights. You can change your flights. It's, a, it's really amazing. Um, but it has some downsides. And today, we're going to talk specifically about search. So when you do a search, 
You send a search out to an airline, you give it you know, a number of passengers, departure dates, um, and a route. You say like where you want to fly. A single search on a single airline can return many thousands of results. Every result is a, an offer that you can book. It's a, it's a, a flight ticket you can buy. And these are sent in the XML format, which um, often ends up being tens of megabytes of XML. It's not unusual to get 40 megabytes of XML back from one airline for one search. And these APIs have very limited filtering capabilities. It, it's a little bit different depending on which specific airline we're talking about. But overall, not a lot of filtering. So if you're going to be, if you're going to build a system to search these APIs, you need to be able to process huge amounts of XML, huge amounts of offers. And it is almost impossible to cache. This almost turns into an argument every time we talk about this, because, or like anyone talks about this, because you, know, you hear this problem, and your first solution is, oh, well, I'll just cache it. It's fine. We can just cache it. And no, you can't. So you just, it is not possible to cache it. And if you want, I can rant at you for 20 minutes after this talk. You just come up to me, and I'll tell you all the reasons why you cannot cache these offers. And I just want to like, share the suffering a little bit. You can look at this pretty um, XML that, uh, that we got back from an airline at some point. But not only, like, not only do we need to search an airline, like that's what we, we've been talking about so far, we need to be able to search multiple airlines. Because in, like, an end user who wants to search for a flight, they don't necessarily care about which airline um, is operating that plane. They just care about getting from one point to another. And so we need to be able to hit multiple airlines. And in Elixir, you know, we do concurrency by having multiple processes. So a very naive solution for this is we can like, start a task, that task itself that, that can uh, run a function that executes an HTTP request to the airline, gets a response back, and does some processing. And we can fan out and hit all of the airlines with a bunch of tasks, gather all the results back, aggregate them, and pass them on to our user. But not all airlines fly all routes. And not all customers use all airlines. Um, and this is important in that airlines, they care a lot about what is called look to book in the industry. Or in other words, how many times you searched before you actually booked something. Um, and, and it should be pretty obvious why they care about this, because you know, they've, they're trying to produce 40 megabytes of XML for every search you're sending. They need really big servers. Right? They, they're putting a lot of money into being able to produce these results. So that makes a lot of sense, obviously. But at the same time, our customers, they want as many results as possible. So there's this conflict, right? So if we look at, like based, like based on that knowledge, armed with that knowledge now, we can look at like a very naive system um, designed for this. So we have one search coming in from the end user. Someone is trying to do a search. It comes into one server. That server decides that this search, actually, like there are six airlines that serve this route. So we send out six requests to the airline. We get tens of megabytes of XML back. We have to parse that. We have to process it. Um, and we have to aggregate it all together and pass it back to the end user. However, sometimes the search comes in, and it doesn't actually hit any airlines. Maybe no airline flies that route. Um, or they, it just hits one airline, and that airline just sends back 20 offers or something. So what we, what we, with this kind of solution, what we observed was that some servers would be really unlucky and have to do all of the heavy searches. They would get like 10 requests at the same time that each had to go out to 60 airli six airlines. That's 60 airlines. That would process all of that data at the same time, while another server is just sitting there doing nothing because it just got um, uh, searches that ended up being discarded. So we have an imbalanced workload. So what can we do about this? Well, first of all, we don't really know which searches are going to be expensive ahead of time. right? 
we could maybe do some kind of magical heuristic on, you know, we've seen this route being searched before, and it took this long then, and then, you know, we can try to distribute based on that. Um, but that doesn't necessarily work because different customers use different airlines. It's, it's like, it's a complex problem. And we need it, whatever we do to solve this problem, we need it to be fast. Right? We can't make it slower. It's already, it's, it's unfortunately already slow. Um, and because we're sitting in between the end user, um, which in many cases is also uh, uh, some kind of system that has to do processing of the offers, and then we have to do processing of the offers, and then the airline has to create all the offers. In reality, often the airline system is actually multiple systems that are like chained together, and so a lot of servers have to touch this data. And we really can't make it any slower, right? We have to be as fast as possible to handle this. And then there's one final um, sort of requirement uh, with this, which I haven't mentioned before, which is that we're talking about a, a synchronous search API. So we're talking about an API where end users are able to send in a search to the API and then wait on that HTTP request until it finishes and then get the results back. Obviously, that's not the only way to solve it, but that's the one we're focusing on today. I put this picture in because uh, I was going to use it to remind myself to have water breaks, but I forgot to get water. So you just get to enjoy. Um, this is one of my cats. When he was quite small, he still does this. He doesn't fit in the box anymore. So he's like, his sides are hanging over the edges, kind of, but it's, he's adorable. He's also kind of a dumbass. <laughs> he, he, he falls off stuff a lot. Um, so then we're getting into the, the actual sort of <laughs> Thank you. The main part of the talk. Thank you so much. We're going to talk about distributing searches across workers using a queue system. So before I get into it, I want to give credit to Andrea Leopardi for writing this amazing article called RPC over RabbitMQ. That um, although. But he's building something quite generic, and what I'm talking about here is something very specific. I'm talking about one kind of workload. Um, this article is actually super useful for anyone who built, wants to build anything like this. It covers a lot of the technical details of how to build a system like this. So I definitely recommend reading this. So before we can actually get into building this, we have to pick a queue system. Um, and there are a lot of options or a lot of sort of factors that go into choosing the right one. Um, this, these are some of the things that we looked at. So the first one I think is quite common to talk about when it comes to queue systems. But actually, throughput is not that important to us um, because we have really heavy workloads. Each message represents a lot of work. Uh, our problem isn't actually being able to put that many messages through the system. It's about actually being able to execute the work uh, once we get the messages through. However, as mentioned, latency is extremely important to us. It needs to be really fast. Um, and on top of that, you know, we, we have a strong preference for managed services. We don't want to have to have a team um, sort of setting up, maintaining, operating, tuning, and tweaking. Uh, a system like this. And so, spoiler, uh, we went with GCP PubSub. And I know, huge surprise for everyone here. Um, and we were already on GCP, so it made a lot of sense. That's a nice pricing model, too, uh, at least for our use case. So just some basics on how GCP PubSub works. Um, it has topics. Topics uh, are what you publish messages into. Um, it has subscriptions. That's what you read the messages out of. It has filtered subscriptions, which we're going to get into a little bit later, um, as well as the auto cleanup, which is also relevant for us. It can clean up stale um, subscriptions, at least. I'm sure maybe topics as well. It supports both pull-based API using long polling and a push-based API, which I think is gRPC. And of course, it's managed, which is really important. Um, and then a final thing that I think I'm going to be able to get into is also me me message acknowledgment deadlines. Um, these are important because when you're working with queue systems, 
you're taking stuff of a, of a queue, it's some kind of work that has to be executed, and you often want to be able to be sure that it actually, um, that work is actually done, and so most queue systems allow you to uh, grab a message off the queue, and then you, ha you have a responsibility to, within the deadline, acknowledge that message, and once you acknowledge it, the queue system is like, okay, I'm done, I don't have to care about that message anymore, but if you pass the deadline, the message is available in the queue again, which ensures then that if you have a server that pulls down a message and then crashes, that message will then later be processed by someone else. So now we have a new sort of system diagram for this. Um, and similarly to before, we have a request coming in from the end user to the API. That, uh, the server that accepts that message does a little bit of like initial processing, validation, that kind of thing, and then puts the, um, the search onto the search request topic. Now, a big difference here, a really crucial difference, is that now, if the end user search actually needs to hit multiple airlines, we can publish multiple messages. So if it's six airlines, we put six messages on that topic. On the other side of it, we have some group of workers that are all listening to a single subscription and getting messages kind of load balanced over them so that they all get to share the workload. And each worker can pick up more messages when it's ready to do so. When the workers then finish their work, they put the, uh, the results onto the result topic. The result topic has multiple subscriptions to it. Um, and I'm going to explain why there are multiple subscriptions. But then the API uh, servers can then listen to their own subscription and get messages back. Um, actually, let's just do that right now. So the way they get the messages back is they each have their own subscription. And the subscriptions have filters on them. So the subscriptions will only make available messages that, are, um, that fulfill the criteria of the filter. And that's how, we can kind of, that's how we can ensure that the correct result goes back to the correct server. So filtered subscriptions are really cool. Um, you can, uh, what, what we do is uh, each, because we use Kubernetes, we have a lot of uh, servers going up and going down again. Uh, whenever a new server goes up, it dynamically creates a new subscription with a filter on its own name. So it's pod name, this unique ID for the pod. Um, and it creates, it creates that at startup. Uh, when it shuts down, it does leave a, a subscription behind. Um, but because uh, stale subscriptions get cleaned up eventually, we don't really have to worry about it. They just go away um, as soon as people stop reading from them. If there are any messages left on that subscription, we don't really care about it because um, you know, we have the API servers um, because of the synchronous API. Whenever they get a request in, they wait for that request to finish and then send results back. If it never finishes or something happens, you know, that's, we, there's nobody waiting for the message anymore, so nobody cares. And we do drain the, message, uh, the requests. <clears throat> So going one level deeper into this, this is what the message format looks like. So obviously, we have the data in there. Data is the result of the search. Then we have our request ID, which is just something we use internally to track um, for logging and observability, et cetera. And then we have that important part here, which is the pod name. By putting the pod name in the message metadata, we can filter on it. And that's how the filter subscriptions ensure that the right message goes to the right pod. And then we have caller ID. So caller ID is just what we call the identifier that we use to, once the message is on the right server, it then also has to go to the right process. Because there is a process there sitting there waiting to be able to send its uh, result back to the client that initiated the request. And then finally, we have a version, which is just something we use for those sort of brief moments where the um, code versions on the workers and the API servers mismatch, and we can just, we just drop those messages. So to publish a message, we use a client. Um, we publish the message which, uh, to the request topic. And then the moment we get an acknowledgment that the message was actually published, we stop in a receive block. So send and receive are the most like 
low-level um, concepts, functions involved in sending messages and receiving messages between processes. So by, by uh, getting to, when we get to this receive block, the, this process will just stop and wait to receive a message that fits this pattern, the search result data, um, up until the timeout that's configured in, in the after block. Once it does receive the message, it just like decodes it and passes it back up the chain all the way up to the, the user that's waiting for the results. And then finally, the, the explanation of caller ID. So the way that the caller ID allows us to associate the, uh, the, the result with the process that's waiting for it is that it's actually the PID of the process that we dump into ETF, uh, ETF format, Erlang term format, which is just serialized um, Erlang data structures or Elixir data structures. Um, it, has to be it has to be base 64 because um, e ETF is not necessarily a UTF-8 like, proper string, and JSON needs proper strings. So, uh, and the metadata for the messages is JSON. But that's basically it. So that, that's how we have those two levels of how the request is then sent and executed on any worker, and then the result is associated back with the correct node and then the correct process. And now um, uh, I actually get to have a water break. So I took this picture when um, he had just had surgery. And the reason his pupils are that big is because he's really high. Um, <laughs> and he was just hysterically like running around my flat, attacking everything he could see for like two hours. He wouldn't stop. Um, it was a lot of fun. So um, you probably heard of Broadway. Uh, at this point, you may have used it, you may have an idea of what it does, but I'm going to talk a little bit about Broadway and how we use it. So Broadway is, a, is an amazing tool for consuming messages off of a queue and processing them. Uh, we, of course, use a separate library to publish the messages to the queue. So Broadway has been around for a while, and I'm sure a lot of you know what it does, but I just want to go through some, some highlights. So this is just taken straight from the docs. You get a lot of stuff for free from Broadway. Um, some of the things that are very interesting to us here is like back pressure, obviously, because the problem we're trying to solve is a single server doing too much work. Back pressure ensures that we can, um, that a worker won't bite off more than it can chew. Um, the graceful shutdowns are nice when you're running Kubernetes and your pods are just going up and down all the time. And of course, metrics. Metrics is like table stakes, right? You need to have those metrics in place in a system like this to actually be able to understand what it's doing in production. And this is also from the docs. This is like an architecture diagram of Broadway. And the interesting part that we're going to talk about is at the top, you have producers. Producers are processes that are responsible for getting messages off of the queue. And then you have the processors. processors um, ask producers for messages, they register demand, they say how many messages they want, and then the producers try to satisfy that demand. So the tweaking that I think is, like, Broadway has a lot of options you can set, and a lot of them are useful in different ways. But these three are maybe the most crucial ones for controlling your workload and ensuring you get like a nice latency. So the producer concurrency controls how many processes you have that are trying to pull messages off of the queue. The processor concurrency is the number of processes that you have actually executing the workloads. And then min-max demand. I'm not really going to go into the min part, because it makes things very complicated, especially over time, trying to reason about how the system is behaving. Um, but max demand is basically how much a processor will ever ask a producer for. And the interesting way these all relate uh, it's right at the bottom. So to be able to calculate the max number of messages that Broadway tries to pr uh, pull off of the queue at any like, point in time, um, you can take the producer concurrency times the processor concurrency times the max demand. So to give you an example of that, say you have one producer, one processor, and a max demand of one. That means that 
each processor will ask each producer for one message. So the producer will go off, get one message, pass it off to the processor. Everything's fine. But let's say you have 10 of each. That means you now have 10 processes, processors that are asking 10 producers for 10 messages. And the processors ask each producer for 10 messages. So that means that at most, you're going to pull down 1,000 messages. Even though you only have 10 processors that can do 10 each, so you're going to be executing um, like the work of 100 messages, while well, you still have 900 just sitting there in Broadway waiting to be processed at some point in the future. So it's very important to tweak these and have these numbers right. And you can kind of see that here. So this is a very early version of running the new search system versus the old one. So the green line is the new one, and the yellow one is the old one. And you see the green one is so much slower. It's like tw it takes twice as long for it to process these messages, or for it to execute the searches fully. Um, and then you have a drop off of the green line where it goes down and basically trails the yellow one. And that's when we kind of we figured out the right numbers to put in um, to get that latency down and make it behave the way we wanted it to. And what's really amazing about this is that now we're talking about a new system that has, it has overhead, right? It's put it, it has a network hop over to the queue system. The queue system has to make the message available. You have another network hop over to the worker. Then you have another network back to, the, to GCP pub sub, and then one last network hop back to the API server to get the messages, like get the whole workload all the way around the system. And it's still matching the old system in latency. That's, like, that's a huge success, right? We didn't make it slower. And the only way to really explain that is that because we're distributing the work so much better now, um, overall, uh, well, at the P99, we're just able to process the work better. And I just want to share that, because I think, it, I think these are pretty. Um, here's the CPU distribution across the workers. And you can see the workers are not really getting, there's no single worker doing all of the work. <coughs> the work is being distributed nicely across all of the workers. So to sort of re, the conclusion of all of that is basically the benefits of the new design. So we have work that is now distributed across servers per airline search rather than per end user search, which is a huge improvement. But we've also now isolated the CPU intensive workload, which is the actual processing of the results. That's where we're all our, like that's what we use our CPUs for. Um, to a specific pool of servers, which means we can do all kinds of optimizations on that pool of servers. We can use uh, servers that are better suited for that kind of work. We can use high CPU servers or whatever your cloud provider um, supports. You're able to use those on that specific workload. And we can now more clearly separate the observability um, for those servers. It's easier to specifically understand what those servers are doing because the work is no longer being mixed with other kind of work. And here's our, my final water break. That's my other cat, Blue, um, doing his podcast. Now, I have some bonus slides as well. Does it, does it look a bit off-center? So one interesting thing that came up was we actually had some memory issues with Broadway. Um, as I was implementing this, I noticed that the Broadway processors are persistent. They don't like, they, you don't start one, execute the work, and then shut it down. They stick around. And my initial worry when I saw that was, well, doesn't it just accumulate a lot of garbage? Um, is that going to be a problem? And um, I asked around a bit, and everyone said, no, I've never heard of that. It's not going to be a problem. Don't worry about it. Um, again, <laughs> it definitely was a problem. But um, Broadway does a cool thing to sort of mitigate this, which is it uses hibernation. So hibernation is something a process can do when it finishes working and it wants to take a break. It can hibernate. And um, at hibernation, that triggers a full garbage collection. It clears everything up. Most of the time, uh, when a process is garbage collecting, it's doing a minor one. It's really fast, but it doesn't actually clean up um, that much necessarily. I think hibernation also do, does like memory compaction and some other magic stuff. But it's um, 
That's basically how Broadway tries to uh, handle this issue. And, um, oh sorry, of, of course it didn't handle it for us. We, um, after putting this into production, we immediately started seeing the, CPU, uh, the memory going up and up and up, and we started getting pods getting um killed because they were using like twice as much memory as before. And to understand that, um, it's just a tiny bit about the Erlang VM memory management, which is really cool. Um, it's a really cool topic, but just like going through it really quickly, the way that memory is allocated in the Erlang VM, well, this, there's a bunch of stuff, but most of it is in like process heaps, right? Each process has its own memory. And because nobody else is allowed to touch that memory, that gives you like this really cool feature, which is if a process shuts down, you know that you don't have to worry about that memory anymore. You can just free it because nobody else can look at it. That process is shut down. Nobody's going to be interested in that memory. You just clear it out, and you don't even need to garbage collect it. And what you can do is, this is kind of a, like a heavy-handed way of solving memory issues, but if you have a workload that, is, that produces a lot of garbage, what you can do is you can run it in a separate process, get the result back out of it, shut that process down, and you just cleared all that memory. You don't have to worry about it anymore. And that's what we ended up doing with Broadway as well, is that when a processor started executing a workload, it would take, uh, it would basically just execute code in a task, wait for that task to finish, and then get the result back. And when the task finished, it cleaned up all the memory, and we didn't have to worry about garbage collection anymore. Uh, unfortunately, there is a there is a bug in the GCP PubSub provider where it doesn't really behave the way it's supposed to. Um, I still have it on my very long to-do list to look deeper into this. <laughs> to fix it, but the way it manifests is that as um, Broadway has graceful shutdown, which is really cool. So basically, it starts by telling the producers, like, OK, time to stop getting uh, more messages. It's time to, like, we're shutting down now. Don't get any more messages. We're not interested anymore. And then it goes to the processors and tells them to shut down. But you know, finish your work first, and then we'll shut down. Um, and it goes through the whole stack like, and tells everyone it's time to stop working. However, the GCP PubSub provider uses long polling. And so the producer, when it gets that message saying, hey, it's time to chill, it's busy. It's waiting for messages to come down from, uh, from GCP PubSub. And so it will get at least one more batch of messages. However, at the point where it actually gets the messages down, there's nobody waiting for it for those messages. There are no processors around um, to execute that work. And so what ends up happening is that those messages are just lost. On top of that, because that process, that process is waiting for the long polling HTTP request to finish, it also blocks shutdown. Um, even if you know, ev everyone's actually done, we're just sitting there waiting for that request to finish. I mean, I, I, I guess I, like to, this is an opportunity to nerd snipe anyone here who is be, who'd be interested in fixing this. Like, it's, it's, uh, it's a really interesting problem. Um, and then that's it. That's the end of my talk. Um, uh, OK, has anyone got questions? You got the mic over there. There you have. Any questions? Hands up. There's questions on the. Um, on the Hoover app, so I'll ask uh, Marco Polita. Are you is on the app? So you might get a question from the from the audience. Can you unmute Marco Polita? Let's see if he can ask his question. Uh, yeah, I'm here. We go. So I just wanted to know if um, other uh, managed um, QE system has been considered other than GCP pops up. Uh, and thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. I mean, we definitely looked at other uh, QE systems just to kind of understand what the ecosystem looked like and what options we had. Um, I think in the end, also one big factor that I didn't mention was the fact that there already is a GCP uh, pub sub provider for Broadway. Um, that just made it a lot easier for us to, to move quickly with this project. 
Okay, and there's uh, a question from Elliot Blackburn. You like this question? <laughs> Elliot, are you there? He's gone shy. Oh, <laughs> I'll tell you what the question was. It was, uh, why can't you cache the search results? <laughs> <laughs> well, do you want to stay for another hour? You I'll tell see. you all about yep. it. <laughs> uh, okay, so we've got a question from Jonathan Manchin. No. Uh, have you thought about using uh, Vue or Woo inside Elixir cluster like P Phoenix PubSub uh, to avoid serializing all the messages? Did that make sense? I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Vue? Like the JavaScript like w front end? W-E-U-E. -E. Q. Ah, OK. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, <laughs> good job, Adam. <laughs> Wait, Have you thought about using a queue inside of Elixir cluster, like Phoenix PubSub, instead uh, to avoid serializing all the messages? Yeah, that is a good question. One option we did look at was to not have like this proper persistent queue system and just pass messages around the cluster. Um, some of the reasons we didn't go into that was that partly we, we wanted the, the safety that uh, like a proper persistent queue system gives you. Things like uh, acknowledgement deadlines, things like persistent, making sure persistence, making sure that messages don't just disappear. Um, even even if you're doing message passing around a cluster, you you still technically you do have a serialization overhead because you still need to serialize the messages across the network. Um, it might be a bit better and faster, um, but we do we do actually uh, use clustering. Um, in production, but we only use it for things where, where we don't really care if the messages get lost. And this um, turns out to be a very good idea because uh, we have observability into this, and messages do get lost a lot. Um, you know, there's this, this, this basically this thing about network splits, and you know, nobody ever really sees network splits. We do see network splits, um, for sure. Uh, there are like, servers that are disappearing, and then on top of that, using Kubernetes and rolling pods all the time means that um, there are moments where the, the sort of the cluster membership hasn't been updated yet, and the messages are just going away into the ether, not ending up where they're supposed to. Interesting. Um, there's a question from Eric Newbury. Is he, does he want to ask it himself? Are you there, Eric? No. Okay, so I'll ask the question. Can you explain more about the memory problem? Was it simply that it wasn't garbage collecting quickly enough uh, and you needed to trigger a, a way to trigger it immediately? Yeah, um, and this is something that, like, again, our, our workloads, are they just, gar they just generate so much garbage. It's just garbage everywhere. Um, parsing XML and then processing that data, it, it, yeah, there, a lot of garbage. And so we do all kinds of things to kind of manage that. Um, and one thing that we have done in the past is just trigger uh, manual GCs to just do a hard GC at certain places where we know that there's um, a lot of garbage that needs to be cleaned up because it, it won't go away otherwise. Um, and we even do that to kind of smooth out the memory usage over a lifetime of a process. Um, but the technique that is the most efficient in doing this is definitely um, having the option of just you know, shutting down the process that has all of that garbage. Um, one possible uh, approach to this would obviously be to allow you to configure how often hibernation happens in Broadway. That could, you know, you could do it more often, that would help. Um, but in the end, I think it would still, like, we would basically need to hibernate ever, after every single um, message is processed. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Johanna. Uh, please, uh, another round of applause.